search clicker it has to be the sun. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 We have somebody Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank everyone for coming to this morning's, to today's board meeting, and we have a forum, so we will begin. Um, some of the board members may be joining us, you know, one or two said they will um, join on the phone line, so we expect they will be joining at some point, but at this point we have a quorum, so we can call this meeting to order. Keith cannot make it this morning, so he has asked me to um, chair this morning's meeting. So, if you can start with introductions, um, starting around the table, I am Teresa Lawrence with DDOE. Uh, John Mizrock, uh, representing Councilwoman Che. Bernice McIntyre, representing Washington Gas. Larry Martin, Sierra Cub, uh, representing Mayor. Lance Long, BDOE. Nicole Snarski, Cass and Charlie, representing the commercial sector. I'm Jermaine Brown, DCRA Environmental, representing the low income groups. Sandra Public Service Commission. The same three in Okay. Dave Cauley, VEIC. Okay, Dave. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Um, so, with the, for the approval of the agenda. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to move that we add something to the agenda. Absolutely. So I'd like to move that we um, add nominations for vice chair and election of a vice chair to the agenda following uh, Sandra's presentation on the SEU annual report. Okay. I second. So noted. So the agenda, I'm having a senior moment here. Um, I thought that the Jerome Page presentation was first. Well, right, yes. that, that's what I was about to say. Um, we had we moved the discussion on the annual report because Madam People's Council has to leave at okay. 11. So okay. yesterday, when we got that note, we, we moved it forward. Okay. Uh, the only reason I said is that I really, really want us to spend some time on the benchmarks. I think it's one of the most critical things we need to do to make sure we're you know, at least getting the right guidance. Well, I appreciate the accommodation. It is a personal family matter. No, no, it's fine. And it was, my presentation will be very short. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, any other notes as it relates to the agenda? Or can we move that the agenda be approved? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any against? So, okay, we have before us two sets of minutes for approval. The June 4th minutes is included because there were you know, some comments from the last board meeting about adding some additional context around the vice chair discussion. So we went back to the tape and um, included some more language around what was actually said 
with regard to the vice chair. So that is highlighted in yellow in the June 4th minutes. And we also have the July 23rd minutes. So we can take a moment to review the minutes and indicate if there are any uh, comments or edits to be made. I appreciate a comment on June 4th. I think that adding in that detail made it much clearer what we did at that meeting. So I appreciate the time and effort. And I didn't have any corrections to that. I had a couple of corrections, minor corrections, to the, the type of really to the uh, July 24th minute. If you look on page 2, uh, the paragraph uh, that's talking about the bylaws committee and my statements, that first paragraph, the sentence that begins, Mr. Martin was under the impression, oh no, it actually begins, Sandra Madhavar Bryce said, I think that should be a that instead of THT, it's just an A missing, and there's another similar typo that I caught on page 6, the paragraph that begins, Mr. Trebu. Yes. That line, the residents, I think it's a doesn't yes. have. Yes. Okay. But I, I, that was the only two that I caught. I had a couple things as well. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to recognize Lenora's effort on these minutes. I really think you did a fine job with them. This is kind of a, the sort of minutes I think that we can use. It's very helpful to us. Um, on page three, the um, mm -hmm. second full paragraph under. Uh, Ted Tradeview's presentation. The first sentence reads, the DCSU last year completed 690 projects, and of those, there were a miscalculation of the incentives. Um, I'm just a little unclear on what that sentence means. Well, it's probably means. one. One. I think there was one. Instead right. of A, there should have probably a. been one. So of those, there was a miscalculation? Oh, yeah. There was yes. one. I think there was one yeah, not miscalculated. Yes, correct. Right. So there was a miscalculation on one of the projects. Right. So that I think that the minutes should reflect that. Right. That was a good. There idea. was just a miscalculation on one of 690 projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then there were a few other typos I caught, but I'll just send you the um, the corrected file. Please. Thank you. Um, to answer this is Betty Ann on the June 4th minutes. On the very first page, um, this is really a technical matter, but it, it starts off call to order, Chairman Betty Ann Payne, call to order the meeting, etc. Now, we know what that means, but anybody on the outside reading it might think that that meant I was chairman of the advisory board. <laughs> I would suggest it say PSC, Chairman Betty Ann Kane, acting as convener, call the meeting to order, just to be clear for the record. Noted. That's the correction. Or a good clarification. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you might want to make a similar sort of uh, statement on the July 24th as far as Veronica, Veronique. I guess she was acting as convener. Acting as, as convener, yeah. Right. Minutes be adopted subject to the correction type of correction. Larry's going to vote. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? The minutes have been adopted as amended. So, first on the agenda, of the substantive matters relates to the discussion on the annual report. As you recall from the last board meeting, there was a comment made that we needed to start to organize how we will, how the board will start this drafting of the annual report that's required in the CAEA. So Madam Sandra Madam Fry has taken the lead and she will make a presentation on that. Okay, good morning again and thank you for accommodating the change. Sure. Um, what we did was to look at the annual report that was filed last year and 
um, determine how we wanted to proceed this year. I think that um, we did a pretty good job, but what I wanted to do was to make certain that we met, you know, certain criteria. And I thought that it's important to ensure that it's the new report is informative, um, easy and clearly read and for both the public and the council. In doing that, I think that substantively the, it's consistent with the recommendation that I'm proposing is consistent with what we did last year, but that it requires a change in the organizational structure. So what I've done is to outline a plan which I've submitted to you. Um, we emailed a copy yesterday, but I'm also handing out a hard copy. And also a copy of last year's report for comparison. Does anyone have it? Get a chance to look at it. Now, I think I, I know that what we want to do, it has a, a, a threefold purpose. One, that it needs to inform the council, obviously, but it also needs to inform the public which is something that we do as a matter of course, but I think we can do it more effectively by the way it is presented. And then it's important for us to provide recommendations to DDOE, which can be incorporated and reflected in their final report and the on a going forward basis. If you look at the plan, what we've done is to, last year's plan had about had five uh, sections. I've expanded it to eight, but what that really reflects is um, disaggregating some of the subsections that were included in last year's report, starting with an, an introduction, which gives an overview of the SMU and an overview of the advisory board and what we do and what, and what our legal relationship, or not really legal, but our relationship to the SEU and then the purpose of the annual report. Now, I know that this was included last year somewhat, but I think that it's important for us to have that this should each report should be on a standalone basis because we're getting, hopefully, new readers and people who may not be familiar with what the SEU does or you know what um, the advisory, do, uh, advisory board does. So I think that's important to include it up front. And just in terms of a general approach, what I've done is to do sort of a um, macro to micro, you know, under the theory that a person reading a certain section could have it all, you know, depending on how much depth they wanted to get into, so that you have the executive summary, which is generic, and then you have a breakdown, which is a little bit more detailed, and then you have a specific analysis of each is issue on an item by item basis. That, you know, facilitates someone to look at it. I mean, one, you can look at it, they can look at the executive summary and say, okay, I know that I've got it by. Or it, the executive summary will provide a framework for um, reviewing particular or specifics down the line. So once the introduction is done, we do the executive summary, and that would include, you know, A, B, C, and D, which would be, again, you know, a very brief discussion of last year's report, um, the 2013 SEU performance, and the report on our summary of the report for FY 2013, as well as a summary of our recommendations on a going forward basis for 2014. Um, then section three would be a, an abridged review of the issues addressed and how they may or may not have been resolved. Again, this is now getting into a more micro-analysis. Mm -hmm. And then section five, four would be the SEU's 2013 performance. And that, in, in, for the most part, mirrors what we did last year, where we did the item-by-item -item review of the, uh, of the 2012 performance benchmarks as well as a discussion of the expenditures, a comparison of the expenditures. Then we would do section five, would be the SEU, our work in 2013. And that's, we, that was, I think, immersed in last year's report, but I wanted to bring it out so that, uh, for two purposes, I think it's important for the public to understand what we're doing <coughs> and the issues that, we were, that were raised, as well as you know, whether or not these issues were resolved or what the approaches were. If they lingering. I've identified like a few, but I think, you know, this is where I would solicit additional issues. Um, 
clearly the gas efficiency programs and the SEU branding, um, the annual budgeting and performance measures, as well as the uh, vice chair function. Now, I'm sure I didn't capture everything, but I'm, you know, I'm open to the committee on making recommendations of other issues that we think should be addressed and you know, should be made public. And again, you know, I think that we need to focus and prioritize. I wouldn't make it, but I'm, this is my recommendation, and you know, I'm open to um, suggestions. I wouldn't make it, you know, everything that we've done, but, you know, to prioritize the things that are important and things that we really want the public and the council to know that we were, you know, grappling with. Just to be clear, the issues outlined in Section 5 are the same that are the abridged version in Section 3? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. And then Section 5 would be, Section 6 would be our recommendation for 2014. And that's, again, a more, a, um, more detailed discussion of what's reflected in Section, I believe, in Section 2. And then the conclusion and appendices. And that's basically it. What I'd like to do today is to um, take volunteers for um, addressing the various sections. OPC <laughs> will uh, do one and two. Uh, one being the introduction and two being the executive summary as well as uh, three, um, five, seven, which would be the conclusion. Um, two, obviously, would be dependent upon completion of sections three, five, four, and five, because that would have to, we would then uh, look at those and collate it, collate it and make them into one document. Go ahead, Vlad. So I had one question, Sandra, about mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the abridged review of issues in section three versus the, um, the discussion of SEU topics in section five. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I understood the difference, but based on, on Nicole's question mm -hmm. and you saying that essentially they're very much the same, my question is, um, where would we, where would we um, evaluate the extent to which our 2012 conclusions and recommendations were addressed and how effectively they were addressed? How, you know, maybe we'd, we'd want to revisit them and say, you know, in light of everything that happened in 2013, you know, we don't feel strongly about this anymore. And, you know, we lay it, lay it to bed. But, you know, maybe there are issues I think that would that go in Section 3. That would go in Section 3. And... Um, so describing... So, se go ahead. I was going to say, describing Section 3, then you're stating that it's addressing whether or not the 2012 issues mm -hmm. were, you're, you're, were advised. Okay. Yeah, I okay. think that that's, that's, that would be better. That, I, and I misspoke when no, I said... No, that's fine. Great. Okay. Even Sounds though you can also include that in, in Section 5, but I think it is more, you're right, Larry, I think it's more appropriate to do it independently and to have uh, us specifically address what happened to... I mean, we will be obviously talking mm -hmm. about a lot of the same things in right. these two sections. Right. Right. We didn't finish a lot of these issues right. in right. right. I would be willing to volunteer for Washington Gas to do five. And... Uh, which means I would do five, <laughs> but with work with help from others from my company, and and put it out for draft review. Right. I think and last that's year, what if yeah. once we make the allocations, I do have a proposed schedule, which may need to be <coughs> tweaked a little bit, um, but it's at the back. So let's just decide who's going to do what. I'll volunteer for three, but I'd like someone else to volunteer with me. Okay. I'm going to go with three, which is okay. a lot of information is left out. And that just leaves four, correct? Hi, Sandra, this is Donna. Yes. Um, I, would, I would take uh, section four with okay. my company as well. Okay, great, thank you. And I, I think for any of these sections, any help anybody wants right. to give, exactly. I certainly you know, you know, I can do a draft, but I would ha like to have a sub team that can look at it before we bring it back to the board or something. Yeah, Bernie, okay. Are we going to have, all right, Nicole? Yeah. Sure. I think that's a lot of fleshing out. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. And one idea I had when looking at this, I think looking back at our minutes, now that we've got them in a shape that they really articulate what was going mm -hmm. on, that we could pull out some of the major issues as a board that uh, we 
uh, did during mm -hmm. that year right. of focusing, focusing and advising the SEU. Mm -hmm. And so, maybe what we can do is, since you're taking that section, mm -hmm. have people forward to you issues that we think should sure. be addressed based Absolutely. upon the minutes and or our right. recollection. Right, and our recollection, and that way we can and forward it to Nicole, too, so we can work together on it. So, um, if I could just, a uh, quick comment. Uh, thank you so much for tackling this. This mm -hmm. is great. My recollection of, uh, in the past, you know, I think Larry was uh, heroically Larry tackled it the first year, yeah. um, almost single-handedly because it was due, and then uh, um, I think you did much of last year. I can't recall. Donna did, okay. It was a team, but right. you know, right. I think somebody has the so, rights. <laughs> so uh, I think this is uh, wonderful that what you've done and that we're having this discussion. Um, a couple of, uh, you know, first of all, I think your focus on this being uh, a public document, both to the DDOE, to the council, and obviously it's a public document, is exactly right. That this needs to be as clear as possible and not assume that people know what's going on. And uh, I think um, I, I'm a huge fan in the recommendation section. I, I like the executive summary in the previous one. I'm a huge fan of, uh, of highlighting things and making things bold and pretty simple, you know, in other words, particularly in the executive summary section, if the uh, recommendation is, you know, X, Y, and Z, you can go into a more lengthy explanation of it later in the report. But for that person that's reviewing it, because what, it, what I found in the past is that, uh, uh, particularly for uh, DDOE, for the council, whoever, everybody's busy and they have a lot of stuff to read. So it's always good to have, you know, one or two pages that are just very specific, bolded, and saying these are our recommendations. So um, I think we should do that. You know, bold, numbered, you know, there are five recommendations, or there's whatever, however we do it. Well, that was my intent. That was why I'm okay. saying the way we okay. should do it is the macro to the micro. Okay. So, again, the takeaway being you could read page two and be done. And then... The only other uh, last comment tonight, um, th there have been some really good uh, paragraphs that I've seen on the legislation itself with the intent, uh, but I'd love to see that up front. Maybe it's a paragraph even in the beginning that the council – I've seen good explanations. I just would love to – I always like focusing the reader, particularly if it's a reader that is really not that familiar with what's going on. If you could identify those and okay. to us, I would sure. that would be helpful. Sure. Um, I, I, the one thing that I didn't, it's section um, six, which are the recommendations. That may be a committee. I think that's a committee. And you have last year's committee, if there are other people who want to join that. Right. But I do think there needs to be a committee, somebody to hold us to the fire. And mm -hmm. since you've taken on the coordinator role, I suggest you be the facilitator. <laughs> Thank you for bringing yeah. <laughs> I volunteered you when you were gone. I know. <laughs> but I'm here now. <laughs> okay, well, that, we can do that. Yeah. Um, okay, that would, you know, in the interest of moving forward, and not taking up too much time, um, I, do, I would like to go to the timeline. And it is uh, aggressive because I last few times we have been, you know, pushed to the very, you know, latter part of the right. submission time. I know that last year, I was trying to recall, um, we it's did it close. at NARUC, which was, right. I mean, it was due on the 15th, right. and we were having Working. telephone conference calls right. at the NARUC mm -hmm. sessions. Right. So I wanted to avoid that and to make certain that we had enough time to review and analyze and participate. So uh, this is the preliminary date. Obviously, today is the date we've done uh, the assignments. I would like a first draft, or suggested a first draft, by September 24th. After doing that, though, I was, I was curious, because I don't know if the fourth quarter report, when is that submitted? Is that the 31st? The, the SEU's annual report is submitted October 30th. It's no, the um, SEU quarter, quarterly report. Right, well, it's, that would be. it's the fourth quarter of the report is in the form of the annual report. Oh, okay. So it would highlight the fourth quarter results, but oh, it would see. be embedded in the annual report. And so when is that? October 30. 
which is why we sought the extension last year between mm -hmm. November 15th instead of October 30th, which is what's in the CAA. Mm -hmm. So it's 30 days after the end of the fiscal year. Okay, so then that means we won't have the benefit of the fourth quarter report. So then these dates are fine. Um, September 24th for the first draft of each section to us for collating. Um, then October, we will turn that around and provide a, a full draft to the subcommittee by October 1st. And then by October 15th, um, I'd like to be able to submit the finalized draft uh, to the advisory board for review. And that gives us approximately a month to tweak it. Uh, I will be... The, mm -hmm. I was asking, would you need the data from, even though it's a self, self-reporting from the SEU, would you need that to help inform? Yes. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but data, are you referring to the, the SEU's actual data? When does that, would that be available? That's what I would want to offer. It might be available a few days after the 15th, not as late as the 30th, but I think we can get you the data. If we okay. slid that date of the 15th back by maybe a week. I mean, you mean okay. ahead. That, that date of October 15th. Pardon? To like 20th or something? Or October 20th. October 22nd. Yeah. But the 22nd, 23rd, is not looking at a calendar. 22nd, yeah. Okay. Right, right. 22nd is a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So you could get it to us by the 22nd? Is that what you're saying? I think we could get you the data that you would need to complete some of the, the tables of your report by that. Yeah, and that would mean, I mean, the recommendations are going to be tied somewhat to that data. And so um, one thing. Uh -huh. Right, I know, and I think I can understand why he has your fiscal year ends. Uh, September 30th, right? right. So it's he's got to compile the stuff, but uh, I think we're always going to be forced. I think the the SC the uh, DDO is assuming you're going to ask for the extension again right. because it's impossible we'll to meet the, yes. the deadline. Um, and uh, you know, if that's the date that you think is realistic, I don't think. Right. I don't think we can do recommendations without the data as well as it met the standard. Um, well, I, I mean, I, unless um, yeah, unless I'm missing some of the, the, the trends, I think in some cases it's going to be very clear to us what they're going, to, which Based when we start is going to hit through November. I understand there's you know obviously a large spend in, in, in September. Not a uh, sorry, yeah, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of a rework, but I do still think we can undertake it. I mean, some of these benchmarks are going to be off by, you know, 100%, you know, half. So I don't think it's reworked to have the framework laid out with some of the language. No. I wouldn't want to wait for the data to start. No, but I'm just saying, course. I just think it's unrealistic to send the report no, to the SEU that, right? before right. you've got the data. That's oh, yeah. not sensible. Right. So we'd have to move that data a little bit back. back and. I would appreciate, and this is just for personal reasons, I can try to get the report to you by the 18th of September, but I'm actually out of pocket 19th, 20th, 23rd, 24th. So the date you're having the, that section due. I can try to get the data to you earlier, mm -hmm. but if you can slip a couple of days, that gives me a couple of days after getting back in the and office. What would work for you? Uh, the 27th, or it would be the best, because then I'm out the 25th. But, I mean, actually, I can try to do it early. I'm just saying that maybe... Well, we'll, why don't we do that? If you can do it earlier, fine. Mm -hmm. um, the 27th works. And so we're talking That's about a range so between... Days. Right. Yeah, but it's only three days. But it gives me a little bit of breathing room. <laughs> but that does not... I mean, if we slip the two dates and we say we're getting the report to the full board by the 25th, does that work? I mean, it gives I us a so. few That's days uh -huh. to get the data from the SEU and massage. I mean, we are assuming we know what's going on somewhat, but we but want we the actual right. numbers in there. Um, so that the, um, the I would 25th. also like to be helpful to you guys. Uh, we would have the August monthly report in, mm -hmm. which will give you cumulative numbers to the end of August. So. Really, the annual report, even though it's going to paint the whole picture, you will just be missing the numbers for right. September. September. Right, and that's why I was only saying a couple of days from 
well, it's more than a couple of days, I guess we're saying. Well, we're waiting for the data. The data would be the 22nd. We were saying that Friday, the 25th. And when do we have the August monthly report? How far into September? Um, you'll have that at least by September 25th. We can get that to uh, you guys. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank prior to the report being submitted or not um, as it relates to the EMNV? Uh, no, Any type of interim updates or not? No, we haven't started FY13 EMNV, so to speak. We'll start the impact evaluation once the year is closed. That was okay, the so there won't be any interim type of information? No, that, that would be useful for this process. Okay. Well, that's what we've had every year. Well, EMB, they can't do the evaluation until the year is finished. So there's not, it's not, it's, it's sort of the way the legislature stuck us with the date. We should really have a different date. I would like, though, to put on our agenda for our next meeting a discussion of when the SCU Advisory Board wants to do its annual report. Right. Because Frankly, I'm a little unhappy with us trying to force out a report before we have all the data in hand. And actually, I'd really like to have the EM&V data before we do our report. So if we don't do our report until next May, I would be okay with that. Not, not for this year, but I'd like to get this on the agenda to discuss at our next meeting, to talk about our schedule. For but, but I do want to add, Larry, that this board's report really shouldn't be dependent upon an EM&V report or even an audit report. You guys perform oversight throughout the year. And that's primarily what your report should be based on, and not someone else's report that they're providing to you. Even the DCSU annual report, it will help provide guidance, but the board should have its own independent report coming out I, and not relying until we've done em and I that's respectfully all verifying disagree. Series. I think that these are important information. But as I said, let's talk about our right. next meeting. I'll just want to we don't want to talk about it. I do want to just put something that, that you mentioned. Um, the ones I'm not so concerned about the SCU results because actually they're pretty accurate. Um, I mean, they're off a bit, but based on the historical performance, that's not to say we shouldn't review it, but I wouldn't want to do a, an annual report by next May. You know, the sooner we can get a report in the fiscal year, the better, because to some degree um, that might motivate some um, changes um, it, with the SCU during the year. Not that the contract can be not renewed, but it might be a, it's a good sort of instructional message to say, hey, look, this is what we find, and it's a formal way for us to say, you may want to consider these things. I think it's something we should discuss at the next um, meeting, because I, I do think that there are issues, um, if we're talking just a change in the date, then, you know, it's a shifting, as not for this year, but, you know, certainly something to consider down the road. Okay. So um, for the, this dates. year, we've got these dates, the right. September 27th for the first draft of the lead section, and October 25th for the final draft. Otherwise, everything else is the same. That's correct. Now, we may want, we may, OPC may want to move that October 1st date down a little, but we'll, that's the sure. soft date now. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. And I'll, thank you again for doing this. Yeah, and I'll, I will uh, take a shot at uh, drafting a paragraph or two that, you know, try to extract okay. from these great. reports. And, uh, okay, great. And Thank everybody you. can play with them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the next board meeting is September 5th, so I guess we can have an updated uh, timeline. Right. Uh, if it's well, we'll, say, we'll email then. something about right. reflecting what we discussed today. Right. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, the other item that was mentioned at the during the approval of the agenda was to have this, have nominations and election of a vice chair. Um, Larry, if you want to lead that discussion, I know in the um, July in the July fourth minutes that we have before us, we have the little blurb. You know, it reads the board shall appoint by election a vice chair to preside over board meetings in the absence of the chair. The vice chair shall take on the responsibilities as agreed upon by the majority of the board, except that the vice chair shall not take upon themselves responsibilities reserved for the chair under the act. So under that broad umbrella, um, you wanted to actually nominate someone. I wanted to have a... Uh, no, no, I don't want to be done. I have a question. I, have, I, have, I, have, I, have, I, have, I think we should have a little question, <laughs> no, um, question and answer period about this. 
I was confused about the agenda when we were going over it because I was remembering the agenda that I got. And so when we talked about moving, inserting this point after Sandra's commentary, I thought it was going to be coming after the Jerome Page uh, discussion. Um, I know the last year is important. In fact, I, I recommended it in, in one meeting. But I really want us to get to the targets. And we talk a lot. Um, and uh, I just don't want to miss, you know, a substantive conversation on the, on the guidepost. So I agree. Yeah. Um, right. We can move this to the to, end of the agenda. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. Know. Yeah, that's okay. okay. That's, that's, the, that's the majority. Then that's what we do. Then Larry will move it to the end. But but I th uh, to Larry's point though, and I don't just I agree with what you're saying. I do think it's uh, time for us to finally come to a resolution on this because we've been right. talking about the vice chair for a long long time. And um, we have, you know, uh, uh, I know that our chair is very busy, but I think this is at least the third meeting in a row that he's been unable to attend. So we probably Correct. should. Uh, the only thing, you would have to leave. So right. when I you're think nominating we, still somebody. A, we still would have a quorum. I was thinking that because we have um, a bit and Kane is on the line and, and Pepco. And so you should have more than enough. We would have a quorum, but. You know, you are selected. You wouldn't be here to oh. say yay. Yeah, Bernie, so, so. do not select me. <laughs> That's right. D don't you, worry. You, you leave it to your parents. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, okay, I so we, I think that. You might, so, you might win. That's good to know. Right. So on that note, we'll ask Jerome Page and Associates to come and give your presentation, and then we'll have the Q&A and feedback. Thank you very much. I'd like to have my colleagues join me. Maybe, uh, I'm going to sit. I mean, I'll stand for now and then. I suppose maybe you could go and sit here. And my name is Jerome Page, and I know many people here. We had the fortune of working on the 2010 report for the assessing the benchmarks, and we're back now to look at the benchmarks uh, two or three years later. I have with me my colleagues, Bo Mathur and, and Gregory Billings. So what we'd like to do this morning is basically three things. <clears throat> One is to uh, go over what we're attempting to do. Uh, two, to solicit views from the board members on the benchmarks. And three, to uh, share with you how we've been doing the issues. So probably we'll start with me talking about uh, our assignment, and then secondly, uh, the framing of the issues, and then soliciting any comments from, regarding the benchmarks. As a uh, preliminary to it, as, as we've talked to people um, in interviews and reviewed everything, I think we need to make a distinction between, when we talk about the benchmarks, the benchmarks and the targets, so just as a sort of preamble. Our assessment is that most folks feel very comfortable with the benchmarks because they basically set government policy. The real challenge is in setting the targets and looking at how the benchmarks interact among one another. So uh, most likely, uh, our, our focus will be on the targets and on the interaction among the various benchmarks. So, um, so we're going to share our approach and get your views this morning. Our assignment. Uh, it's, it's somewhat relatively narrow in the sense that we've been tasked with coming up with uh, an assessment of the reasonableness of the benchmarks. And then specifically, after looking at all the benchmarks, look at the green jobs, the renewable energy, and the, uh, uh, the uh, low-income housing benchmark. So this is what we're focusing on in terms of our assignment. So we're going to evaluate the benchmarks, update the benchmarks, propose a, or evaluate the bonus penalty scheme, and just to highlight that we're not here to evaluate the SCU. That's, that's somebody else's job. That's your job. Or, uh, if you want to bring us back on another contract, <laughs> we'll, we'll be glad to come back. And do that. But our, our focus is on the benchmarks globally, but more specifically the targets and the interaction among the benchmarks. So uh, we want to, we, we, we take what we, we would be doing so far is taking into account the uh, DCSE goals, including the internal trade off and then the constraints by the DCSEU. And we'll talk about this approach in a little bit more detail 
the, our overall framework is to talk about a set of goals and a set of constraints and then how we meet those goals given those constraints. And we'll be talking a lot about that. Uh, we've discussed with uh, several representatives from DDOE, the SEU, PSC, uh, OPC, Washington Gas, some of the advisory board members, and uh, in consultation with Adana, we'll be talking to Pepco sometime early next week. Uh, <clears throat> so we reviewed the legislation, we reviewed the contract, we reviewed reports, and we reviewed benchmarks from other SEUs. And our goal is to take all this and to formulate our own independent uh, views. So what are some criteria? Since our goal is to come up with uh, the reasonableness of the benchmarks, we have to come up first with some criteria for reasonableness. And so this is our working list so far. The first criteria is the purpose. Is, is the purpose of the benchmark still valid? Yes. Would you mind going back to the prior slide? Since sure. we don't have it in front of us, I, um, um, one of the things that, that you may want to consider in your approach to look at, I don't know how far along it is, I know that DDOE is, and the city is looking at a comprehensive energy plan. And I don't know how far along they are with it, but part of that energy plan was to sort of do some market sizing right. to figure out, you know, the, the potential in the marketplace. Because um, I think that'll be very relevant in terms of what they're able to achieve. I know it's relative in terms of percentage, but it, it will tell you, it'll be instructional, like what's the size of the energy market or Correct. potential in the city. Right. We have been shared a copy of the market potential study, okay. and we're, we're in the process of reviewing it. Great. Thanks. That's a good point. All right. Thank you. So again... We're going to come up with, we're going to assess something for reasonableness. We need some criteria. Uh, one is the purpose. The second is, is, the, uh, is everything defined clearly. That's the definition of clarity. Can it be measured? Can it be attained? And uh, given, as we talked about, the interaction among the various targets, uh, what's, how effective is the yield? And then... Are there similar criteria that we can borrow from other SEUs? And we, we've been charged to look at six other models across the country, and we'll be sharing with you some of our observations on those as well. So uh, the, when we look at other SEUs, the key issue is that uh, and the six models, and Gregory, you can help me with this, there's the Vermont, there's Ohio, there's Oregon, New Jersey, Delaware, New Jersey, Delaware, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. And Cambridge, Massachusetts. So let's go over the list again. Uh, Vermont, Vermont, um, New Jersey, <laughs> New Jersey, Delaware, Delaware, Ohio, Ohio, Cambridge, Cambridge, and Oregon. Oregon. And Oregon. Okay, great. You passed the test, Gregory. <laughs> you did it twice. So. Don't ask. That. <laughs> so we we've, we've noted three distinctions among the the six. One is the funding mechanism, uh, two is the performance benchmarks, and the third is the management mechanism. And, and Gregory, you can kind of chime in on some of this. Uh, in terms of the funding mechanism, do you want to briefly say something about the funding mechanism? Um, you have to speak up enough so that the people on the uh, phone can hear you. What I've observed in reviewing the uh, landscape of the six SEUs out there it seems to be um, many of them involve have sizable budgets and involve leveraging because in order to um, in make gains, you have to make a sizable investment first. So that seems to be a big part of what's, what's out there. Um, they're receiving funding from repairs, gas and electric. Okay. What, what do you find about the benchmarks? Uh, the benchmarks, is seem, they seem to target absolute goals and not... Um, they seem to target total kilowatt hours saved or total therm saved um, or total renewable energy um, delivered. Um, so they tend to focus on those things. Okay. Uh, and then in terms of management models, briefly? Uh, I observed in a research there are three, primarily, three primary management models. There was a utility-run, utility-led model. There is the state-run model, as well as the independent uh, entity-run model. Okay, you want to just run through that list again? So some people are taking notes. That's why I'm asking you to repeat. Okay. <laughs> the utility-run model, the state-run model, and the independent entity model. Okay. Uh, city, and then, does anybody have any questions about the other SEUs right now? 
Um, yeah. Which ones are the third party entities of the six? Third parties are um, Vermont, let's see, Delaware, yes. Oregon. Oregon set up an energy trust independent model, but they report to the Public Service Board. Yes, we can forward. So really, there's only two models. Um, efficiency on three. Efficiency on the state. But they're all third party. Third party. Yes. <coughs> but they're all receiving taxpayer funding. Right there. Right there. Right here. Right right From what I've seen, yes. And how um, how old are these programs? I think Vermont was the initial one, perhaps. At where? At what stage are the other ones? If you recall. It looked like they started in the late 90s, most of, most of them. Uh, some in the early, Oregon started their program in 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Delaware, has, they legislatively, they started their program in 2007, but they really did not get going with it until recently. They launched two programs recently. The name of the program is State. In New Jersey, is it the state of New Jersey? Yes. Okay. When you were looking at the different models, were you looking also at the, <coughs> the um, mm -hmm. customer demographics in terms of you know what sectors they serve? You know, Vermont, how much industrial, commercial, residential. Same thing with these different. You know, DC has you know its own sort of demographics, and so I was just curious to see if you all took a look at that um, to, to note that the, some may be more similar um, in terms of the customers they serve than others. Generally, we looked at it, but we didn't quantify specifically what percentage of each economy was the different sector. We don't have hard numbers. Well, I think it's a given that we're demographically we're probably like different than almost ever. Almost all. Okay, so that, perhaps Cambridge, not but because uh, that's a city, that's a city but otherwise. All right, so um, we can if we, we can also, if you have specific questions that you, we don't address here, sure. you can feed them to uh, Teresa, and then they'll, they'll come to us, and we'll be glad to respond to them. So you, we're going to get stuck on one slide. Yeah. spend too much time. You don't want us to contact you at all hours of the day, Lex? Uh, no, that, that's, that's doable. I just thought in terms of protocol, it's just yeah, better to I'm kind of channel it. Being facetious. I know. I understand. Well, okay. I'm available 24-7. No, yeah, I know. That's okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> He didn't say he would respond. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, so we, we talked about our overall framework. Uh, we see the benchmarks as goals. And then uh, we identify what we call the external constraints. And by external constraints, <coughs> these are the re real or perceived challenges which are beyond the SEU's control, the fiscal year. The um, living wage contract uh, obligation, the, um, uh, the various anything that's in the legislation. So these these are things. These external constraints are beyond DC SEU's control. Uh, so these these are constraints on meeting the goals. Now we, we said that the, they're real or perceived. Right. This is part of our data gathering. Uh, we've talked to a lot of different people, and so that somewhere we might say, for example. Uh, that's a constraint. But somebody else says, no, that's not a constraint. That's just the way you do business in D.C. You know, so it's not. So we're, we're sorting that out. And so as we go through our iteration process, we'll come up with a, a final set of what, what we would consider to be the external constraints. Uh, and then there are the internal trade-offs. Uh, most of the people we've talked to and also the, the interaction by uh, or our review of the data is that the legislation really uh, asks the DCSEU to focus on energy efficiency, uh, green jobs, and social equity. And social equity is defined in terms of the uh, making sure that the energy efficiency of low-income housing is improved. So we have these three goals, energy efficiency, uh, social equity, and uh, job creation. The job creation being the uh, green jobs. So the, the trade-off notion is that if you you spend, if your cost of business goes up, 
because you have to devote a certain percentage of your funds to low-income housing or that you have to meet certain guidelines to create jobs, does this take away from you being able to achieve the energy efficiency goal? Or if you want to maximize your, your, your energy efficiency goal or you want to achieve larger energy efficiency targets, to what extent by, by, by uh, cording off a set of money and having the, uh, con the constraint on green jobs, of constraint of green jobs each from meeting that. I would say we call them trade-offs. Nobody disagrees with the goal of job creation, uh, uh, low income housing, or energy efficiency. So everybody embraces those goals. It's a question how you how we treat those. So we're just talking about the trade-offs is not saying that we don't want those those uh, particular aspects. So we have the goals, we have the external constraints, and we have the internal trade-offs. So uh, again, to, to, to uh, elaborate on that, we see the, the act as specifying the achievement of specific goals that, that may conflict or have these trade-offs within a fixed budget. And so we all have to, to do things within the fixed budget, resource allocation, trade-offs. So there are DC rules and requirements imposing fixed constraints. And these constraints aren't just constraints for the DCSU. They're constraints uh, by anybody who does business with the district government, including Jerome S. Page and Associates. So we have to, when we, we sign our contract, we have to sign off that big package of, of regulations that, that go along with everything. And, make sure we have the insurances and the, so anybody who regardless of the of the of the who the contractor is if you do business with the district government you you have to um, you have to buy by these rules and regulations we're not suggesting here just like we're not suggesting that we do away with energy efficiency or green jobs or job creation we're not suggesting that we we change any of these DC rules and requirements even if we could what, we, what we're attempting to say is we need to recognize their impl implications for the DCSU meeting the energy efficiency goals. Um, so likewise, the DCSEU is trying to achieve specific goals subject to external constraints and internal trade-offs. And that's what we, we're struggling with is specifying those, uh, 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 those um, external constraints and those internal trade-offs. So, the key question that we've, we've come upon is that even if each benchmark is reasonable, and then we, we want to say, is the package as a whole reasonable? And so that's where we ultimately want to end up. And so what are some of our possible conclusions that we can draw? One is that if we look at everything, we say there should be not any changes. Uh, the second, we can change one or more goals or the targets within mm -hmm. each goals. Or three, define more realistically what is counted in meeting the goal. So that's, that's our sort of three possible outcomes when we get to our final report. So um, also we've identified benchmark number one as being the key goal. And then we want to look at how everything ultimately influences benchmark number one. And benchmark number one is, is specified or named the reduction in per capita energy consumption. We'll come back to that because even though the, the name is the reduction in per capita in, in energy consumption. And most people refer to it as the reduction in per capita in energy consumption. The way the benchmark target is specified is targeted in terms of an absolute number. So it's, it, it's independent of population is that the SEU has to meet a 1% reduction against the 2009 baseline. So in meeting that, population really doesn't come into consideration. So there's a there's a is a specification or a naming of the, of the benchmark as a reduction in per capita of income, but in fact, it is an absolute number, so to speak. So anybody have any, is, that, is that clear to the board members? So, okay. Um, so, with recognizing benchmark number one as the key benchmark, we pose the following questions. What effects do the constraints have on all the benchmarks? And then what effect do the trade-offs have on benchmark one? So our overall working hypothesis at this point is that we, we can make minor tweaks to the low income and green job benchmarks, which we consider high priority issues. We can retain the renewable 
peak demand and largest users to make sure they do not conflict with benchmark number one. And then three, we can redefine benchmark number one so that it's reasonable given the uh, budget and external constraints and the priorities of the uh, other benchmarks. So what do we mean by redefine benchmark number one? Right now, it's 1% it's, it's of the 2009 uh, baseline. And so redefining that should be higher than 1%, should be lower than 1%, or we might decide mm -hmm. to keep it at 1%. But once we get that, then we can look at how everything else then feeds into that. Well, benchmark one has more than that aspect also, because it's defined in kilowatt hours and in thermos. So yes. that's also possible. That's correct. That's, a, that's right. So it's a defining the level and also the calculation of it. So it should it be in kilowatt hours or therms or in terms of just a BTU measure. Mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, okay. So here's a sort of graphic to help us get our minds around it. We, at the bottom of the graphic, we have the desired outcomes of the act, energy efficiency, uh, social equity and jobs. Uh, we get the six benchmarks. Then we, we have what we call, we've identified six external constraints and uh, three, uh, two internal trade-offs. This leads us to our actual outcomes of the, regarding energy efficiency, social equity and jobs. And then from that, we can determine the reasonableness of the benchmarks. Okay. Am I with me so far? Okay, next. Okay, so what are the goals? These, for many with these, the six goals are the reduction in per capita energy consumption, increase renewable energy capacity, reduce the growth of peak demand, improve energy efficiency of low-income housing, reduce the growth of energy demand of the largest users, and increase the number of green-collar jobs. So those are the goals. What are the potential external constraints? Uh, and one is the requirement to use the CDEU, CDEs. Uh, the second is the requirement to pay a living wage. The third is the small industrial base, given the large institutional base. Uh, number four is the annual renewable DC SEU contract. The five is the small, small percentage of gas funds as part of total SETF funds, and six are the, what we call the restrictions on uh, leveraging. So let's um, go back one. Yeah. So yes, let's start with and see whether we have any comments on, on any of these, so, or ask these, us any questions about these. Are these in, in sort of the order of, of priority that you all see? No, okay. they're not in order of priority. Okay. This is just a laundry list of people. I got it. I do believe the restrictions on PCSU leveraging is, is huge because I think that that will cascade into a lot of the other um, okay. targets in terms of how much energy can be reduced, how many jobs can be created, you know, if the, if the job counting is, uh, is redefined. Okay. I mean, that really is to me sort of a uh, first order issue that has um, secondary impacts on many of the other targets. All right. Okay. So this is this is feedback. This is, we're here to get your view. So. Uh, the fact yeah. that we have this leveraging issue. Somebody's on the phone? Uh, yeah, it's Betty Ann. Um, How are you I just doing? want to go back to do the, the one of the reducing per capita energy consumption. Refresh my memory because I'm not at my desk. Um, is that per capita reduction, the term per capita, in the statute? Uh, yes. Yeah, I believe it is. It is. Yes. yes. The term, yes. the term is in the statute. I think it, it is the term per capita in, in the, in the no. or is it overall energy use in the district? And the reason I'm asking is that, at least for electricity, we have a very unusual load shape in the district. Um, all, if, if you do it on, you know, per capita, you're talking about taking energy use and dividing it by the number of residents, I guess. Um, number of people in the district and reducing it, um, but we have only 15 percent of our electricity load is residential, is what you would call on a per capita basis, and 85 percent of our electricity use at least, and Bernice can correct me because I don't have the figures in my head on gas, um, but 85 percent of it is commercial and institutional. And so I have another question, is that's a constraint when you're talking about measuring it on a per capita basis as a rather than an overall 
face. Yeah, and um, Betty, Betty, my understanding, and I think Jerome has said this, that we have been interpreting that language in the statute um, yeah. in a way that does not take into a, the account the population. It, we have not been doing it that way. So we've eliminated that particular issue. Okay. We eliminate that issue. So we're still looking at overall use. Right. And we're looking at energy use, um, overall energy use total. Okay, thank you. I just want to, you know, that's something that comes up when we talk about where to target um, uh, the, um, uh, where to target the, the, the programs. In terms of that, it's the residential lease and electricity is a very, very small part of it. And Lance, you can help me with this. In terms of the contract, the contract is specified in the reduction of not per capita, in, well, per capita in, not in terms of per capita energy consumption, but a 1% reduction in the 2009 base. Yes, but it's still yeah. oh, well. the yeah. base. But, okay. you know, as you pointed out correctly, it's an absolute measure. Right. You know, so if we're taking the 2000 baseline, we're really just taking per capita completely out of the equation. So, you know, it's well, that's good. So I, we probably shouldn't use the term per capita then when we're talking about it. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Sorry, uh, Council, I mean, uh, Chairman Kane, could you say that again? I said we should, if it's not required by the statute, we shouldn't use the term per capita, but should use the term, as is pointed out, the contract says overall. I think it is required by the statute. Well, yes, 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 we, yes, have, we have interpreted yes. that <laughs> language in a different way because I think everybody had agreed that we couldn't do what for that meant. Just like we filed this report after it's due. But uh, so I think that's the what we have been doing. That's probably something we need to look at when we look at the okay. legislation. But I did have a question independent of sure. that. On the external constraints, you say the small percentage of gas funds is part of the total SETF funds. And uh, I think that, as I recall, under the statute, the funding was done based on, you know, the number of customers that were gas users, mm -hmm. all of the customers in the district mm -hmm. that have lights or ele electric users, and it was done on a, on a rationale from that perspective. So I don't understand why it's ending up as a potential external constraint. Okay, we probably should specify this to clear, is that currently, for benchmark one, as you know, it's a 1% reduction for... Uh, electricity and 1% reduction for gas. And our intent here is to show, given the level of funding, it would be hard to get the 1% reduction for gas. And more importantly, historically, how we've been collecting revenues in the SETF, 80% of it comes from the electric company and 20% comes from the gas companies. If you do the math on any one year's budget, you will really see the total portion of funds available to spend, even though the statute allow you that flexibility that you can go up to 125 percent extra, it still is not a significant amount of money that will help us get to the one percent. Well, I mean, we're well, talking about funds. 13. Uh, how much money are we talking about? A couple Let's of take next year. Dollars. Next year, it's 20 million dollars. If you go with that 80-20 split, then we're simply still talking about four million dollars coming from the $4 gas million company. Dollars. I mean, I just how much do we do in gas programs? I mean, I just don't know. And, and I look to Colin. Is that rational to reach that? Is it because gas programs are more expensive or something? I, I don't understand the rationality that that's a constraint. And maybe my lawyer talking. Sorry. So I'll leave well, it to. I mean, I don't. I don't they're, they're more expensive. But the gas is already so efficient. So it is to on the efficiency scales. So you don't have a problem with that being seen as a constraint? No, I mean, I don't know, because I don't know enough about the detail behind it. It, you know, it seems like a lot of money, but, you know, because we don't spend even a million dollars. But we don't have a goal like this either. So it's, I haven't matched the two together. So Bernice, we'll, we'll, we'll just mm -hmm. like for uh, uh, Joe, Joe yeah. we'll, we'll note, you know, Joe's considers uh, it's number six as being important. We'll take in your consideration as we free Yeah, it. Yeah, I'd like to understand what's the underpinning for that because even if we spend a million and they've got four million and we're serving three jurisdictions, then I don't understand. That doesn't logically follow from a lawyer's point of view. <laughs> so, you know, maybe operationally I'm missing something, but I would like to understand that. I'm not disagreeing. 
I just want to understand how it's been strengthened. I understand. This is this is this is the purpose of putting this list up mm -hmm. here is to get your feedback, and mm -hmm. that's so that's what we're doing. So we're not again. We say these are potential. Some mm -hmm. people might see them as constraints. Others may not. They may stay on the list. They may fall off the list. So I had another concern with. Uh, and also, Dr. Page, they had a question. Was it confirmed that reducing per capita energy consumption is a part of the actual law? Yes. That language is in the law. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, thank you, Don. Yeah, and so, excuse me, Betty Ann, again, but the law says per capita energy. It doesn't right. say per capita electric. Exactly. Right. 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 I think another constraint is, in a general way, if the benchmark is set, which we're talking about, so the gas and electric are treated, se they're treated separately, the funding for the um, under the statute, but in terms of treating them separately for the 1% reduction, it doesn't allow any, well, it doesn't allow a, a lot of flexibility in looking at programs that might reduce electricity use um, but increase gas use, like fuel switching or different, you know, it, 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 I, I, I didn't identify that as a constraint in the current benchmark that it's 1% for gas and 1% for electric. Um, and I see that as, as a constraint, as, as, a, as a challenge, right. treating right. those two things separately rather than overall energy use reduction. That, that was the concern I was right. also going to raise with respect to C5. I think that um, the way we separate out gas and electric doesn't necessarily lead to our best, most efficient energy reductions in the district. Okay. I think we need to look at them as, as combined s supplies to energy. Okay. And I think the prospect of fuel switching is very, is very real. I mean, we can see tremendous efficiencies um, by moving to district heating and cooling, combined heating and cooling electricity generation. And the way we're currently structured doesn't really allow us to investigate that as fully as we might. Okay, good. And then uh, to Larry's point, which I agree with, but there's an additional constraint in the legislation goes back to the funding, the whole 75% of yes. gas funds yes. that has to be spent on gas-related programs. So we're still kind of hamstringed by that requirement of the legislation. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's the, yes, this is Donna, and that's, that's one of our concerns around uh, going in that direction as well. Oh. I think that there's been, you know, that there's probably consensus that that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And right. I think that historically, when we started, it was, um, you know, gas prices, where they were at the time and where they are now, and just the efficiency gains that have occurred with respect to gas. So that it needs to be um, reviewed, you know, to reevaluate it. Okay, sort of jumping ahead in terms of coming up with a redefinition, operational redefinition of benchmark number one, we may have a combined energy target subject to the spin. So. I, have, I have a question about that constraint uh, that was mentioned, and I agree sort of on, um, on the face of it, it is a constraint because we're getting money from electric ratepayers and so forth. Um, I, I'm not sure why it needs to be. Like, my, my question is, do these customers who are paying into um, the fund, they'd want lower cost, more efficient energy. I mean, this is not HEPCO's money or Washington Gas money. It's the, it's the private, it's the commercial customers. sector's money. It's the customer's money. It's the customer's money. money. <laughs> and so to me, I don't see it as a constraint. Okay. I see it as, that's great. That's the way it was, the funding was set up. Maybe that needs to be switched. But in essence, we're doing what's best for the, the customer. Well, for I, the yeah. city. And just repeat, repeat it, but the constraint is that the contract says 1% for gas and 1% for electric, and that results in certain difficulties to attain the energy reduction that you want. There are also, just as you said, and I think, Jerome, you said it best of anybody ever heard, the goal should be combine a, a combined energy target subject to the spend limits. Because the spend limits are there, and and seeing whether we can achieve that, and it is the customer's money, and all the customers, if they have energy sources, have both. They may have just electricity, but if they've got gas, they've got both gas and electric, and that's the customer is the one we want to try to give them the best products. Most for. efficient product. That's what the SEU is trying to do. I agree. 
hundred. Okay, great. Any other comments on this? Again, if you if you go home and you think about this some more, <laughs> feel free to channel any uh, additional requirements or requests up through uh, Teresa, and then we'll be glad to respond to them. Again, this is a working list. This is not to say this is our final list. I, I'd suggest one other thing, and just when you say external constraints, you might want to de define it. Are you talking contract? Because that helps us figure out what you're talking about. Okay. Or Can operational go, or something. Go back a couple slides. Okay. One more. Oh, okay. So um, the external constraints is what you mean here, right? So, yeah, they, they, those are things that are given by law and any legal requirements. Any statutory law and statutory are the same, so these would be the external constraints. Um, then, so we'll, we'll, we, but we can, we'll take that in consideration, make sure that's more clearly specified. Okay, All right, thank you. Okay, so we can go next to the internal trade offs. Um, and again, the internal trade offs are the energy efficiency, social equity, and job creation. And here, uh, we note that um, the percentage uh, percentage of funds for low-income housing and the number of green jobs we see as the two <coughs> major uh, internal trade-offs. Uh, again, just re-specifying energy efficiency versus social equity versus job creation. And the, the last bullet there sort of reframes what I just said in another way in terms of questions, is that is the DCSU primarily an energy efficiency entity it has some social benefits in the form of green jobs and assistance low income households, or is it a social goal en uh, entity that produces energy efficiency savings? And so this is part of what we're grappling with in terms of trying to begin to reframe the issue. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I have to observe that this is the classic <laughs> definition of sustainability. You've got the environmental outcome, which is energy efficiency, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, you've got the social equity issue here, and you've got the, the green jobs, the economic development dimension. Mm -hmm. um, this is what sustainability is about. So that's the classic three legs of the sustainability stool, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to get past the idea that it's trade-offs. We need to look at how we're going to use these three different dimensions to reinforce one another, to build one another. It's kind of new territory in, in the human mind, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's a challenge that we need to rise to. And I think the SCU is, is grappling with that. And I'm not sure they're doing such a bad job of it. But it's, as you say, it, in the face of it, it looks like trade-offs. Well, Somehow we have to get past the idea that it's trade-offs. Right, and that, that's a good point. So if, you, if you're defining sustainability as a three-legged stool, then you've got the energy efficiency, the social equity, and the, green, and the, and the economic development. Or we've talked about green jobs. And so the question is, how do we... How do we um, address that? And then, but in terms of the framework of, of the, the, one of the questions, and we'll, we'll address that in a subsequent slide, is recognizing that, then what effect does that have on re being the DCSEU being able to reach the target of the reduction of energy <coughs> efficiency? So, as we said before, we're not rejecting any of these. I think you've done it. I did a good job of paraphrasing that. But then the, we have to take the next step. But given that, and what effect does that have on benchmark number one, or achievement of benchmark one? Yes. Yeah, to actually to uh, amplify my view on what Larry just said, uh, uh, this, this was a very creative piece of legislation that is only in a handful of other places, each of which is very different from the district. And it, and it is, uh, you know, Betty Ann said earlier, you know, we've got... Uh, uh, only 15% of our energy is used by residents and, and the rest by commercial and institutional users. And uh, uh, as Sandra pointed out, we've had these uh, remarkable energy swings just in the space of four years, which, which should or shouldn't, I mean, they, they certainly matter to what, the SEU's what, what happened in the span of four years? In, in 2006 and seven, the spot market price of natural gas right, was fifteen dollars okay. an MCF. Right, gotcha. And then all of a sudden, we had you know half year supply of three dollars or two, whatever it is. But um, uh, which is dramatic and remarkable. Uh, 
Um, so um, this is a creative piece of legislation, and which I think we're all trying to help SEU figure out how to implement. And the, and the benchmarks are critically important because we need the oversight. But, but to Larry's point, I think we uh, need to try to help SEU figure out what they're doing. And, and also to accomplish all their goals. I just say that, that one's hard. Okay. You know, yeah, I have, and I'm going to supplement what Larry said. I have a real issue with the term trade off. Okay. And in fact, um, I, and I know, Jerome, you didn't come up with this. I mean, I actually hear people in the hallways of different organizations, you know, saying stuff like, well, is this a efficiency um, you know, program or is this a jobs program? In fact, it can be both, and it, and it has to be um, because it's reaffirming. Uh, to me, the economic development component is what's going to make green stick. Um, it's just a small percentage of money that's being spent. You really need the market to sort of take over and make it a part of what we do every day in order to have a meaningful impact. So if you don't actually have... Now, maybe the way that um, the jobs are counted needs to be looked at. Um, the issue of leverage, because think about this. If you can leverage $20 million five times or even three times, here's $60 million you put into the marketplace. That's a lot of jobs you can create, you know, depending on, on what you reduce. That, to me, is, is a huge issue. It needs to be. But uh, at least from my perspective, and, and I've heard a few other board members say the same thing here, this mindset actually self-defeating. Uh, it is, because then you're not really working to be, to, you know, in conjunction with always have a reservation about about it. And so therefore, you're not going to be as effective. You're not. No, no, no that's, that's a good point. So we'll make note of that. Uh, so, yeah, good. Okay. But actually, Oregon, um, the way they do it, the Energy Trust of Oregon does it, they have 75% of the, the funds collected, the Energy Trust focus on energy efficiency. They also have a separate institution focused on low-income housing. And then they have another institution focused on improving efficiency in schools, educational institutions. So, and the way they structured it, each entity is single-minded in terms of their focus. They're very focused. That makes sense. And, and just to follow up on that, uh, we, we started our process of looking at the other jurisdictions to see what benchmarks they had. So that's what you do when you do benchmark studies, mm -hmm. peer, peer report studies. Well, we, the feedback we got was pretty much that, that DC was the, 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 the DC was the jurisdictions to be benchmarked against. Right. So, we, we, in other words, we're setting the standard in terms of the creativity that, you, that has been mentioned here, and other jurisdictions are looking to us. So it's, it was sort of a very interesting uh, set of findings. Was that your, your sense, Gregory? Yes. You want to switch it out a little bit? Oh, and yeah, when I contacted Delaware um, and told them how the contract was structured with the EIC and, and the, the benchmarks that we had established, they, uh, they were very impressed. They said that we were, we were ahead of them. So they're looking to get to where we were. We're ahead of them, but we don't even know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got to say, I think it's the target, not the benchmark. I think sometimes the target's are wrong. So, yeah, again, we, we, we'll talk about separating out the targets from the benchmarks in terms of clarifying our discussion. So, so what, I, what I get from our just discussion here is that using the trade-offs uh, sort of sets up the wrong framework for thinking about it, and that we should, we should shift to a sustainability framework which recognizes how the three legs of, three legs of the stool fit together, and then once we recognize that, then we still have to ask the ultimate and the additional question is how does that affect benchmark number one? Yeah. So I think we, we, we're pretty good on that. Okay. But again, even when we, when we talked to people about it and when they were using the language of trade-offs, nobody said they wanted to get rid of the low income requirement or to get rid of the green jobs requirement. So what the question is then can we specify the targets in such a way is that all these could be met? And I think that's consistent with Barry, what you're, you're framing on the issue. Thank you. Okay, next. So, um, in order of discussion, we, we rank the order of discussion based on the, the number of funds, the percentage of funds that are at, at risk. So, for benchmark number six, the DCSEU has 25% of their funds at risk. At risk. 
benchmark number four, low-income housing, 20% at risk. The reduction in demand for large users, 10% at risk. Benchmark two, uh, increase uh, in renewable energy capacity, 10% at risk. And then the uh, benchmark three, reduction in the growth of peak demand. So as we discuss these six, four, five, two, and three, we want to see how they roll up to influencing benchmark number one. When you say at risk, you mean their um, penalty versus incentive, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. They, call it, they refer to it as at risk compensation. Is that the correct term? Yes. Okay. It's at risk compensation. Thank you. Okay. We're next to the next slide. Oh, okay. So we, we basically, yeah, we we've talked about we've talked about many of these. So let's go back to the other slide. Thank you. Um, so we actually talked about those. So uh, are, are there any sort of general takeaways that the board has based on the discussion so far or additional insights before we... Yes, Joe. Um, a couple of things that I've noticed, and I wonder what other uh, jurisdictions are doing around this. To, to some, uh, in some respects, these yearly goals sometimes don't, in my opinion, allow for proper market engagement. And this is what I mean. Um, so, really, the SEU doesn't have a real incentive uh, to promote or incentivize audits, both residential or commercial. Um, there's the, the DDOE audit program, which, you know, whether I don't think it's continuing because of funds, but nonetheless, that's a way to really engage the marketplace. On the one hand, you're educating the consumer as to what you'll be doing, and, and it's also required because it sets the benchmark within the building in the home as to what the energy is going to be, is going to be done. There are no commercial sense for commercial audits. It also really helps the small business community because you're educating them um, more wholly on the notion of you know, what it is to reduce energy. Yes, we have BPI um, you know, contractors, but if you don't practice doing these audits and really understand what's happening in the particular structures, you don't understand it as well when you're doing the implementation. There's a disconnect there. There's a disconnect. And, I, and, and, and what I hear, and this may just be what I'm being told, but what I hear is we, there's really no incentive for us to do it, Joe, because we don't, you know, we got to go for the implementation. I have a, a different view to that. I think it's going to lead to more effective implementation, but that's one of the observations I had. If the goals or benchmarks um, somehow conflict with what I consider to be, you know, intelligent market engagement, then I would want us to look at that. Okay, so um, one of the Getting so one one potential additional re, uh, criteria for reasonableness would be to the extent that it that <coughs> particular helps it promote and market engagement. Yeah, I mean, no, not that that's a benchmark. In other words, no, no, not a benchmark, but, but the actual, criteria. Yeah, as a criteria. criteria. I mean, it, it may be that we ought to have had you know a more sort of aggressive sort of ramp up in allowing the SEU in the early years to do some of these things without some of these targets, you know, so that you could really engage the market. Because at the end of the day. And I'm going to speak about this now. That's the only way that we're going to achieve our goals here. The second thing that I think is really important um, is to look at the way that, that these goals are measured um, because that plays a big role in terms of whether they're achievable or not. I also uh, believe it plays a big role in compliance. And I can tell you from a market engagement perspective, compliance um, is a huge issue. And you find, Tech Tech may or may not have found this, but uh, you find fewer and fewer participants with uh, SEU programs because of this. And it's not the SEU's, um, I use the term fault. They're literally having, they've literally put in place um, what we've asked them to put in place to meet these, uh, these goals and these targets. And it's onerous, incredibly onerous, to the point that you, I don't want to engage in something. So, you know, here I am, a dedicated green contractor, and I don't want to do it. Because it's a pain in the butt, the money isn't there in order to achieve a lot of compliance. For a, even for a fifteen hundred dollar job, I'm spending two or three thousand dollars worth of time in order to fill the compliance for that. So really, we got to look at the way things are measured as well in compliance. The other thing is we looked at things that were different um, in, in other jurisdictions, and that's why I asked um, if you guys were, were privy to the energy plans being done here. DC is a very unique. Um, Market in, in many ways, but it, it's it's got it's got one of the main unique things is it's a company town and the company is the federal government, which is already promoting a lot of energy efficiency. You have a lot of you have a huge built environment on the commercial sector. That I mean, you, these goals, if you could leverage this and engage the commercial market, which they want, if you have really good paybacks, these a lot <laughs> of these goals you just knock, you know, knock the ball out of the park. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be an issue. 
Uh, so, so, we, so that's a really important thing. The, the, uh, a group took a run at that about four or five years ago. Hannon Armstrong and others led what was a $500 million effort on commercial buildings. Nobody was ready for it. So. I, I have to say, I, I believe they are now. I can tell you, I believe they are now. Oh. We're, we're getting a lot of inquiries from, and, and, and you know, Cassie Troy can talk about it, but C.B. Richard Ellis and, and uh, Douglas Development, uh, Jamal's group, there's a lot more mm -hmm. engagement there. Yeah, so, so, Joe, just to, just to recap, to capture your points, one is the time frame of the annual contract, the need to do multi-year planning. That's number one. That's correct. Uh, so number two is the issue of uh, compliance. Number three is the issue of the measurement of the benchmarks, how they're measured. And then... The measurement oftentimes impacts the compliance. Correct. I don't want the compliance to be its own. It's, it's how they're measured. They're, they're basically, they put in place what they need to in order to report stuff. So, you know, it's, 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 that's the issue. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I just like to layer onto that two things. On the measurement, I think is that, you know, there's always going to be some things that you have to track and trying to make sure we've got the most efficient ways from a management point of view or from a, a hands on point of view to sort of track. Like the 75%, you know, of electric funds have to go for electric ratepayers as they do for gas ratepayers. 75% of the funds we contribute. So that's another, that's something that's built in, and but it, you don't want to make it so onerous that it makes it difficult for them to do their programs. Yeah. So that's just one point. The other thing is, is what came out of our conversation with your group yesterday, and how do you incentivize people who have projects that are going to take multi-year to believe that you're going to be able to give them the rebate in the second year out when they get to it? Is there a way that we can allow the SEU to give money for the planning process of the design phase or something else that will allow us, even despite these DC rules about not being able to contract over a year, tie that um, that entity to using the SEU. Right. So again, your, your two points are very important. One, again, <laughs> it gets back, back to the multi-year, being able to do multi-year commitments on part of the, the DCSU, and mm. many people have challenged that. Uh, and your issue of, of relating to this, the how do you how do you calculate or how do you account for the planning that needs to take place? Uh, as, as we understand it, because of the annual contract. The, most of the accounting is, is taking place in terms of what can be completed within the fiscal year. And so a lot of the planning stuff uh, carries over. So the kind of project, my colleague uh, Sabot there has sort of given us a framework to kind of think about this. The kind of project investment, he call, uh, projects he calls uh, investment subsidies. So you, you give some rebates, you have a project. And then he talks about that, what he calls the catalytic subsidy. These are the pre -plan the planning subsidies. How do you how do you get the how do you get credit for the activity that you invest this year that doesn't manifest to year one or year two? And so uh, the part of the challenge in terms of getting back to uh, Joe's point in terms of specifying the measurement, if you measure only investment subsidies. You're not going to you're not going to get the SE DCSU to, to engage in catalytic in types of investments, mm -hmm. and so this this becomes the measurement, then drives the the, the behavior, okay. and 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 then, and then the outcome, and then uh, getting back to the other point, you know, sort of speaking uh, in academic kind of terminology, uh, we we have certain types of measures within a in a, within a, within a uh, performance measurement framework, and you need some way to account for all of those. You have input measures. You have process measures, you have output measures, and you have outcome measures. The, the uh, DCSU contract is a performance-based contract, so it's ultimately measured on the outcomes. But there are things that you, we, we need to know some process information, the tracking. And we also need to know the output, you know, the number of jobs, the number of dollars spent. But the ultimate outcome is did you reduce energy consumption uh, in, terms, in terms of, or right. did you reach the benchmarks? Right. So we need a framework to, to sort of take into consideration the input measures, which are the resources, the process measures, which how things take place ongoing, the output measures, 
did you do this, that, and the other in terms of the number of jobs created or the uh, houses insulated, and then the ultimate outcome in terms of have you met the ultimate goal. So that's something that I know from looking at the uh, uh, updates to the contract, you, you, you see more of, of tracking kinds of things coming into the contract amendments. Uh, so uh, then question Larry and then for, Jermaine. for maybe you and, and also we track some of these outcomes against the dollars invested. Is that right? I mean, we have a certain budget, and you know, we essentially track the outcome against the budget. So, yeah, I was thinking with respect to your second point, Bernice, um, this whole matter of multi-year in incentivizing um, outcomes for future years. Would it matter? Would it help if the SEU were to take a certain amount of its budget out off the table? for purposes of evaluation, saying, well, you know, we put $3 million into the, the pipeline, building the pipeline for high efficiency projects two and three years out. Mm -hmm. So we don't want that to be considered as part of our evaluation for this year, because basically we're not getting anything in return for it this year, but we'll get big returns for it next year and the year after. Does that make sense yes. in terms of a multi-year performance? kind of approach to... There are several things with that approach. One will have to go back and change the entire structure of this operation. Take, for example, That's if they... Years. No, but if they do that, there's no guarantee that they will have the contract That's next right. year. That's right. So that's one. Secondly, if you take that off the table from an em &V standpoint, we're only going to measure the savings that were created within that fiscal year, so to speak. Right. And, you know, the lifetime of that savings, we'll take that into consideration. So there's no way we can simply take that $3 million off the table and say we'll count it in some out years when that uh, savings are materialized. You know, it's just not practical to do from an EMB well, standpoint. Let me, let, me, let me just say this. this the SEU is, a, is a, an entity created by the District of Columbia to serve a purpose for the residents of the customers. Even if the SEU, per se, being VEIC, were not doing that mm -hmm. program next year, mm -hmm. I'm assuming there's a commitment of the D.C. government to continue the program. So, I mean, I just want you to make sure you're not thinking in the, you're not mixing apples and oranges because the aim is to produce the the reduction in energy consumption for the customer of the D.C. residents. Mm -hmm. So even if the contract weren't renewed with this SEU, there will be another SEU, I'm you assuming. That's what it, so, is. Yeah, so Stop worrying about the SEU and worry about but, who's and, paying into this fund. So I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not sure. I just think we should. We, we do have a very creative or different type of thing we're trying to create here. So sometimes we're going to have to be imaginative as we did with the per capita <laughs> issue to work around you know certain concerns. Yeah we are trying to work on but to to be correct, you know, to your point, the SEU yeah. is really a contract. It's not a, an established right. legal entity. It's just a contract with VEIC will have another contract to come into place. But as I was pointing out to you in terms of from an EM and V perspective, if that three million, whether it is spent in building the pipeline, it would be counted as a cost. And when you look in terms of the cost effectiveness, you will have a huge cost on this one side versus very limited savings, which would make their entire operation for that year not meet any of the goals in the portfolio of a whole wouldn't be cost effective. So it's extremely hard for them to do given the way the measurement is taking place. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, let's, let's get Jermaine in here. Um, no, I was just, once again, just thinking about year to year. And like I said, just year after year, this has been the same situation. It's just them not being able to move forward in in the future years. And um, I just got involved with uh, the Office of the Deputy Mayor, and they have a great program where me as a contractor, and I, I was discussing how the SU program's going, and they were talking about what's going on. But they have a new program. It's, it's been going. It's the Gray Streets, and they give every business owner $85,000. And what I do is help them get the grant by actually – Describing what's going to be done to improve their buildings, how it connects to green job creations, and also how it helps low income. And you can't get the 85000 unless you are absolutely going to try to implement this. But the great thing about it, it's a reimbursement program just like they get reimbursed for the money they spend. Sometimes I feel like they're spending their money and we reimburse them for stuff they shouldn't even be spending their money on. But the great thing about this project, this program, is that 
you don't have to have the whole 85000 to spend. You can spend 5000 at a time and get reimbursed and still go into future years because the money is about the program and not really the contractor who doesn't get the contract renewed every year. Mm-hmm. And, it, and them payers allocated $10 million. And I've gone across 11 neighborhoods and 11 gray streets just signing up actual business owners to get this free 85000 And then saying, I'm taking them to the SU and saying, okay, we got 85000 Maybe only 25000 is going to be spent on energy efficiency. What can you do to join in on this so you can get some savings and have some bragging rights? But I just think we're just not looking at different ways to making this work. I think DDOE is still telling us you can't do this, you can't do this per the legislation, and we stuck it. And every year DDOE is going to get some money out of this deal. Every year the SEU and the rest of the employees are getting hundreds and hundreds of employees are stacking 80 M Street. And then I see there's a problem with green jobs because you're not employing no residents to work inside your building. And I feel like every year, to me, just, just, just me speaking, I feel like there's no money really being spent on these programs. There's not a lot of contractors out here getting money with the SEU or getting contracts with the SEU. And if they do, say for this year, there's barely any money spent. And at this point, I'm really ready to see, at this point, if you really want to see how things work, you've got to create jobs. It can't be a, a social economic versus green jobs versus energy efficiency. It all works together. You got to find a way to keep these guys working, and you keep them working by not putting so much on the contractors. Now, I feel like a lot of the work that the SEU should be doing is on the contractor to do and turn into the SEU, and that's where the contractor ends up spending more money than what the project's worth. So, just just to paraphrase, you, and, and I, yeah, yeah. I know that the, uh, the Great Streets program is is, is, a, is a wonderful program. Looking at Eighth Street, looking at Georgia Avenue, a lot of businesses have. I've looked at that. I think that the key here, and I'm not a budget expert, is the $10 million that the deputy mayor's office establishes. You know, this is subject to the Anti-Deficiency Act expenditures, and so that's a question. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking you to answer that. I'm not asking sure, you to yeah. answer that. Everything, but that, it, 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 everything, everything district office. Columbia yeah. government, yeah. any contract put out is a part of yeah. Anti-Deficiency Every, Act. And people seem to figure out. And, and, and yeah. some people's already <laughs> went there. So, okay. all right. <laughs> so. Uh, that, that's an interesting model, and we can we can explore. Right. We can we can look at that. Yeah, I, I was somebody on the phone. Yeah, you know, this is Betty Ann. I wanted to go back because I picked up in, in the, the conversations before this about the 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 year to year funding is a constraint that can't be changed because of it, it, without a change in legislation and B, you're still dealing with the Anti Deficiency Act, which I agree. I've been 35 years in D.C. government. It's always there. But it doesn't, in a lot of cases, act as a kind of practical constraint that we seem to be facing here. I think we started in the previous conversation to look to, to, to work towards a solution, which is there's a difference between the annual contracting and how we evaluate. And the idea that investments, planning, multi-year um, projects um, can be evaluated differently would remove at least that constraint that, uh, because how it's evaluated and how the benchmarks are set are not set in statute in, in most cases. There's, you know, the, the, that's why we're having this discussion. What should the benchmarks be? Um, what should the programs be? And I think that there are ways, and I think we were working some suggested people were discussion before, towards, yes, it will upset or change or disrupt maybe the way uh, it's, it's been going. But, we, I mean, I've been on the board two years now, and this is the same discussion of having to have projects be completed in one year because that's how they have to get evaluated. Well, I think there's a way, and I think we put our heads together on that, um, and, you know, with... with Jerome Page Associates said, I think you've identified that in our conversation, that you can make a distinction or you can set up your evaluation and your benchmarks so that they can account for, in an appropriate way, multi-year projects, while the funding, because of the statute, et cetera, has to actually be doled out on a year-to-year basis. That's a very uh, good framing of the, of, the, of the response, the summary of the discussion and the questions is that we have year-to-year funding, but we have to look at ways to figure out how do you do multi-year projects. Mm-hmm. And, and 
based on what Jermaine has reported in terms of the Deputy Mayor for Economic Development and what Commissioner Kane's 35 years experience says, that we can figure this out. So right. that's, that's, that's a good point. One more thing. I think in one of the slides you mentioned that this, is, this report or what you're doing, study, isn't looking at the DCSU's performance, right? Is that was there a point right. there? Well, we're not evaluating. 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 We're not doing a management. I understood. But, but, we, we, but let me share with you how that impacts the targets and the goals, which are important. Um, the way that the programs are designed and then rolled out directly impacts some of these targets. Now, in, in speaking with Chuck, you know, some of the energy reduction is annualized. So if the project is done in, in August and September, um, you know, you look at the uh, annual benefit for energy. But if that project is done in, you know, in, in August and September, you don't really annualize the job creation, um, but the inefficiency is still there. And so you still have a significant amount of fixed costs throughout the year for program implementation, and the programs aren't being implemented. We still face, I, I've talked about this hockey stick, and it's getting better, and I think the SEU is in a good position next year to try to avoid that. But if this, uh, if, just, we haven't been around for your discussions without but, but laboring it, a point that obviously the board has heard many times. What's the hockey stick? It, well, it goes to the, the, the spend um, happens towards the end of, of a particular year. Okay. It, it was natural the first year because it was a, a partial year contract, but subsequent years it's existed. Okay. Um, you know. to, just to perhaps try to clarify, the, the budget for SEU is from October the 1st to September 3rd, and they have to spend the money by September the 3rd. Part of the issue is some of the projects are longer term um, and don't lend themselves to comfortably putting it in a 12-month period, number one. Number two, in past years, as Joe was alluding to, uh, there was not a lot of money spent until the summer, and then all of a sudden, from June, July, August, you know, all the money got spent, which may have not, in previous years, been the optimal way to spend. Okay. And, and, and so, Joe, are you saying that this is <coughs> this is partly a, a program delivery, design and delivery? Uh, I, I, yes, issue? yes, I, I do. I think it's I, and and the steadiness of it, and it just may be the natural course, organic course that these things take. But, I, you know, from a business perspective, um, I see, and again, this is just my opinion, um, a lot of inefficiency um, with the way that the money is spent. And so, as Jermaine was saying, um, you know, the SEU gets the money, the DOE gets the money, Tetra gets the money, but it's not out in the marketplace working the system to create the jobs to reduce the energy. It's just not. Okay. Uh, and that just may be what it is. I just don't know. Yeah. But, but I do see it. And it's, to me, um, it goes back to the point, like Joe said, with the audits. They don't see any reason to put any money in anyone doing any audits. But as a contractor, I'm doing audits. I have to go out, assess that big old building, count every light bulb, right? Then everything I'm doing with no money being paid by the SEU or anything. And then turn that in and then get back a, a form that shows me how much money they're going to invest. So that's, that's kind of good in a sense. But now we can break that up in phases. So that if my client says, hey, Jermaine, it's, it's August now, and now they're ready to give us some money. Well, we can do buildings one, we can do floors one through four. And then from there, when September 30th comes and goes, then we'll go to the next phase if they're still around. So now I have to basically expose my clients or basically explain to them what's really going on here so they're not making other decisions based on me just saying, hey, we got this much in funding, we're going to audit your building, we're going to do all this. So I'm telling all my clients, Basically, we're going to do everything in phases, so you don't have to spend all this money or even try to do the whole building at once, and it doesn't get done, or it runs over, or the project's not completed by September 30th, so we're just going to split your building up, and that's kind of what I worked out with them here, being able to do the building in phases, and that helps a whole lot better, so whether they're here or not in September, we still can move forward. I just keep saying, you know, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice, and that's what's going on. All day long here, and it just it just seems like it's not really getting to the contractors. And then once the contractors are gone, the jobs for the residents are gone, the social equity is gone, everything is gone. So you have to find a way just just to help the contractors and help the business owners chop it up. The same way it's been chopped up 
the money's been chopped up to 20 million a year and a little bit here, more there, and more there, it has, to, it has to change. That's all has to change. We have to stop looking at it as just a pot to help DDOE, yep. help right. Tetra Tech, help SEU, and their employees. It, it's really got to filter down. It's not filtering down. It, it's wasting money. Yeah. It's, it's really being wasted. Okay. Uh, Lance? Um, going back to the benchmarks, um, I know we only have about 30 minutes left, so I was really interested in hearing the board's views on each of the benchmarks. For example, I know you put up benchmark number six and we're working our way down. Um, I know for us as DDOE, we would love to hear you guys' view on the current benchmark, whether you think we should uh, improve on it or keep it the same. For example, the Green Jobs benchmark. Right now, the way we measure it is for every $200,000 that is spent, the SEU is supposed to create one job. So the target for next year rolling forward would be 88 jobs. And as you know, the way we verify that is collecting certified payrolls and some type of proof of residency. So I really want to throw this question out to the board to ask how you feel about the current methodology and is the target reasonable for the green jobs benchmark? And I have a, a, well, a comment on that. The 88 jobs are also in the field. They're not just within the structure. They don't have to be employees of the SEU. They that's could be subcontractors. Yeah. Exactly. It's based on total number of hours worked so, by everyone that's paid from DCSEU. Right. And, I mean, I, I think as, as, as uh, Jerome said, we don't have an issue in the overall benchmark. It's how we implement it or whether there's there's ways to make it easier for the, the, the goals to work together to get to the sustainability. When I see this 25% of at-risk funds somehow as sort of targeting the weight that the board has ascribed or the contract ascribes to the benchmark, I think that's not really truly the, a true reflection of that weight because I think instead it's the reflection of 88 jobs or, you know, whatever that, that the, the bottom line outcome is. So I was wondering how, I had a question for you. Why do you assume that the incentive compensation is determining, or are you assuming that that is determining the weight of that particular benchmark? Okay, well, let me, let me, let me answer that question by making a statement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We, 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 in one of one of the discuss in our, our discussions, one of the things that came out was uh, a board, a board or DDOE, if somebody needs to prioritize the relative importance of the benchmarks. I made that statement prior uh, to the discussion we had about sustainability being defined by a three-legged stool. So this is this is pre-sustainability discussion here today. So that we need some way to prioritize. We had no way internally of, a pro of prioritizing, so our first cut at that was to say, well, let's look at the way in which the SEU is compensated as a way of, of giving the relative weight. You'll notice that the, the relative weight is on benchmark number one, it's 30%. The uh, reason that we, we rank them this way is because in our thinking in terms of a final report, we want to say as we either keep or change the way in which we measure the other six benchmarks, to what extent do we need to lower the, the, their relative importance and increase the relative importance of benchmark number one. So we still hold off benchmark number one as the number one priority. And so the next question is, uh, as we rethink the benchmarks, if we do less or more or count or don't count in terms of, of this, the uh, catalytic investment kinds of things or the capital budgeting types of things, do we need to raise the relative importance of benchmark number one and reduce the importance of the others? So. Um, Lance, to, to um, answer your question, you know, I'm sort of the deputy mayor's appointee for economic development and green jobs. So it's obviously something I focus on a lot. Um, question, where did, did that two, where did you get that $200,000 number? At that time, it's a number that the consultants came up with. We did some research right around when our first came into being to really come up with a number that it takes to create one job. And I think the 200000 was a very, very reasonable number we came up with. It fluctuated back then between 150000 to as high as two hundred forty, in some places 290000 for a job. Yeah. Um, and it's based on historical costs of doing weatherization. Yeah. Uh, 
So with some extrapolations, they came up with the 200,000 figure. You know, which still seems to be very, very reasonable to create one job. I agree. I, I've seen uh, figures lower, some studies that were done, you know, from 125 to, to 250, mm -hmm. I think, or 220. I think it's very reasonable. I think it, it gives a lot of yield there. Um, I think that the AA job number is fine. One of the questions that I have is, um, like, so let's say, especially as you move more into leveraging in two fronts, there's a direct leveraging where you get some financing in place mm -hmm. um, to increase the funds. The second element of leveraging which could exist is the market participation. You know, we've seen that in the T12 to T8 right now, the 30, 30%, 70, 30. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will increase. Do, um, is it possible to count jobs induced, you know, with investment or technical assistance towards this? I know that's a little bit more nebulous, and I understand the difficulty of it, and, and, and it, it can be played. But ultimately, you are creating, you're creating a green economy, going to what Jermaine mm -hmm. was saying, filtering down. Mm -hmm. Part of the, the issue, in my opinion, is I don't think the SU has effectively engaged the market. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. That's part of, perhaps, why the targets aren't being met. Mm -hmm. The other part, in the measurement of it, is because I think they only get um, count if they provide the direct, the, the money direct. So, how many jobs are they creating, and this is a, perhaps a ludicrous example, but with the efficient products, mm -hmm. right? You know, that were, uh, did, you know, they, with, the, with the retailers. How many jobs are they creating with the whole performance piece? I think they do measure that, where they, mm -hmm. where they have it. But there are things where they're putting in an investment um, of effort, at least intellectual capital, and then in, in certainly money. I just want them to get counted for jobs induced, and I know that's really nebulous, and I don't have an answer for you, so I'm trying to do that. And, and that is true. You know, counting induced and indirect jobs are, are very difficult to do. I mean, it takes a lot of time to do it. And more importantly, it will change that target. Yeah. That 88 is based solely on the direct jobs. If we're going to go to counting induced, then no. we're talking somewhere north of 88 jobs. I, I believe it's a very reasonable number. It should be achieved um, with proper market engagement and roll out of programs. I have no and, and, and just to, just to, 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 to note here that it's a green job which defined as it's held by a DC resident and that it uh, pays uh, a, a living wage or above. So, so the requirements, so that the, um, the DC SEU creates, a, 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 say, a universe of jobs. And then of that universe of jobs that the DC SEU creates, 88 of those should be green jobs. That yeah, that's the way we count it. So if the SU went out, say, for example, and created 100 jobs, but only 50 of those belong to DC residents, then we would count only 50 towards this benchmark. All right, so question on the, uh, the for example, the home performance example. Mm -hmm. um, the money goes directly to the homeowner, right? The rebate? Uh, you know, I don't, yeah. it does. So, mm -hmm. but you guys do get credit for jobs, um, for home performance jobs. No? Sure. For the, so for here's the, for the contract reporting those hours. Right. Well, yeah, for the installation of it. Okay. But let's just say, I mean, rebates can go to the homeowner, but they can use any contract that they want. It doesn't have to be an unapproved contract. Mm -hmm. So that contractor would then have to report to you all that job. That's this is the incentive is let's say $500 if you do, mm -hmm. you know, 1500 to $2,000 mm -hmm. worth of work in your home. Um, are you guys tracking? You know that, you know, like so, the rebate goes to you know Mrs. Smith. Um, the contractor X does it. They have to report to you. Those jobs. I mean, yeah, we get the reports from the contractors, but again, with the customer share involved, it's um, we're not directly contracting. We don't have a direct contract relationship with the contractor. You wouldn't, but would you get credit for that job? Yeah, if we can get the reporting. Well, well, that's, 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 that's out in itself. How are you going to get a report from a contract who doesn't even know what he should be reporting? They, that's, that's, there's, there, ought to be, there ought to be a form we that know. has to be filled and out. That's, and that's great because that's just like me. I just think the rebate program is a great program, but 30 days is a long time to wait on a rebate. Right. I, I participate in the River Spa program. You can get paid in 10 days. You can do it yourself as a homeowner or you can pick a contractor. And that's a great program. Permits paper removal, but I'm just saying, with as you, if you really want to make some some real progress, you need to really have this rebate program put out here to a lot of DC contractors, and then just have a form submitted with them where they're showing the jobs they create and work on the job. It, a job rebate program might be two days, but if they can line up a hundred 
rebates with 100 homeowners, then they can keep these guys working, and then you yeah. can show the job creation. Yeah, it's out. I just know that the jobs are not being created because you're dealing with contractors who just doesn't even know about this this um, basic requirement. Well, I think also we have to verify that the DC residents work on the projects. And how are you going to do that in a rebate program? How are you going to identify that? Nobody's collecting that data. Right, but the way home performance works, you have to pay it to the you have to pay the rebate to the customer based on the job. Performance. The customer meaning the homeowner. Yep. Right. So you still don't get that job. You still don't get that information reported. There, to you. There's a way to do it. I mean, I, I don't think you can solve that. And, and, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way it's set up right in now. Interest, in the interest of time, yeah. we, we've noticed the issue. Yeah, we can go, but I just I feel like we just set up everything from the get-go wrong, and then we go to another year or so, knowing that it's set up wrong, and then we come back and have these same meetings. I'm basically tired of having the same meeting over three years about the same stuff. When is it going to end? And Lance, you can sit there with your head down, but you you know what's going on. And sooner or later, I'm not going to just keep coming in this room, having this conversation. Man, you're going to have a conversation about what's going on. As a board member, because like you said, as a board member, we can get this information. We're supposed to go out and get these reports. But you don't give us no assistance in getting a lot of these reports and information we need. Gentlemen, let's pause for a second. Take the same home performance when you just saw a program that you're railing about. In order to participate in that as a contractor, you have to go through the SEU verification process and sign up. They'll put you on a list as a certified home performance contractor that residents can use. As part of being on that list and signing up, you would agree to supply these reports to the DCSU in terms of number of hours work. The DCSU provide a small incentive to you as a contractor, along with an incentive to the homeowner to get the job done. So you need to understand how the process works before you start screaming that it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't work. I, I do know how the process works. You, so why are you not the on the list thing? if you want to? I don't have. To, I don't have. To, I, don't, I don't want to be on the home performance list because it's a mess. What do you mean? I have to pick and choose what I want to get into. You don't you don't pick and choose for me. That's, what I'm saying is you just said it right. That small incentive that goes nowhere. That a contract is not going to deal with doing all that paperwork for that small incentive. This DC, you get twenty million dollars, you spend the money. So when you really get influence the market, don't hand a, a contract a small incentive and then you got a stack of paperwork. It's not gonna work. Okay, on that note, we have um, just, um, I'll just do a time check. We have 20 minutes left, okay. and if we still wanted to get to that last issue that was put on the agenda, I think we need, we need to reserve at least 15 minutes for that discussion. Um, but, so if we can, um, Jerome, I'm not sure how much you had left. Um, well, we can, we can, I don't know whether it will generate more discussion than we have time, but we can run through some of our preliminary thoughts, and then you can then follow up. You can follow the issue. Sure, if you can. Just okay. Um, on benchmark number six, uh, it's sort of preliminary findings. Maintain the current benchmark. Uh, some of the suggested changes that people talked about. Uh, check, change the way in which we count uh, the jobs and include estimated work hours. Uh, and particularly uh, dealing with how do you count jobs that arise when the subcontractor is hired by the client and not the DCSU. So the, the discussion that we just had kind of influences that. Uh, but then in, if, we, if we're going beyond the, the hard count, the initial head count, then we would limit the number of, of estimated work hours. So we might have some factor where you get 30 or 40 percent of the estimated work hours to count the work jobs. Uh, again, these, these are all things that are in flux. Uh, so, our preliminary thinking is to maintain the current benchmark with some suggested changes. Okay. I think that I think that's a solution set right there. I think the estimated has to be a model. I mean, it can't just be something you pull out of a dark place. But you know, a model to um, to kind of characterize how a contractor works with uh, with a homeowner or something like that. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. And, you know, it will be a statistical model that will be based on some projects of similar, uh, right. you know, work type and see the number of hours that are generated with those, yeah. you know, so that's where we'll be going with that. Makes sense. Okay, in terms of low income, we want to maintain the benchmark in general. And some suggested changes would be uh, the, the, the uh, low income benchmark is the only one that's specified in terms of dollar spent. There are no fiscal units no, attached to it. No. And so we would say require a minimum yield uh, in terms of the uh, uh, BTU savings. And then we would not recommend that renewable energy be included as part of the spending for the low income. So again, we, we are massaging these and 
you'll get a chance to see these before we finalize the report and, and be able to give us some time. Uh, next one. The largest users. Um, here, we basically recommend that we drop the term largest and then talk about large users because we don't really have any definition for largest. And then, instead of talking about uh, the benchmark in terms of BTUs, and the reason we, we, we say don't talk about it in terms of BTUs is because ultimately our model wants to say, how do we redefine benchmark number one? And so you can't really get to benchmark number one if you're not engaging the largest users. So don't put a specific benchmark or BTU savings there, but just uh, track what the, or it can have, this is one of these tracking things that Bernice talks about, is you could just track the BTUs from the largest users, knowing that those will ultimately into the, uh, into the uh, ultimate savings. And then we would set the uh, at-risk funds for this benchmark at zero, and then maybe raise the at-risk funds for the, uh, the uh, benchmark number one. Uh, Betty, this is Betty Ann. On that number five, on the growth of energy demand of largest users, and even if you change to large users, should we really be talking about Growth of energy demand. Um, should we uh, should we be talking about reducing overall use of the large users? That's a good. I mean, I, that's a, that's a good well, uh, given that you know that the previous set, the large users are DC government, federal government, hospitals, schools, DC water, and uh, metro. Those are the large users. Um, and I don't see any growth in use even occurring there with or without the SEU. Um, those big ones, federal government, D.C. government, are quite engaged in controlling their energy use. So I question whether reducing the growth of energy demand um, is something that's going to happen anyway. I mean, it's, it's leveling off. Right. Yeah, I think we're talking about to targeted, more targeted reduction for the larger users? Yes, I, I think, uh, uh, Commissioner Kane, is that well, what we're ultimately measuring is the BTU savings that the SEU projects generate and, the, and, and what, the, right. what those savings are from the largest users. So it really is not related to growth or not. Uh, in other words, right. if, if, the B, if the DCSU engages the largest users, and it saves X number of BTUs, then right. Then that's it's an absolute, it's absolute savings rather than reducing growth. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's it. Good. Next one, Lance. Uh, the for the reduced redu uh, benchmark number two, the renewable energy capacity. Um, here we want to re we're suggesting changes is to reformulate that away from price changes because many of the price changes are market driven and the way in which the benchmark is written now is that there needs to be a 10 percent year-to-year reduction in the cost of installation. Uh, we're not quite sure how to define this one yet so we'll need some additional, we'll have to spend some additional work on reworking that benchmark. But we would recommend that given the uh, cost per kilowatt hour of, of renewables that we reduce the amount of at-risk funds allocated to that uh, particular benchmark. I would, uh, I would not be comfortable with making that decision until the rest of that whole calculation was worked out. Okay. You, know, you said you have some uncertainty about you know, how you're going to measure and what have you. That's correct. I, I would not want to see that reduced below 10% until there was a more thorough discussion about it and okay. understand all, right. all the implications. That's good. Okay, that's duly noted. Um, the reduction in peak demand, uh, we don't see any reason to make any changes here, and we, we feel like the current specification is reasonable. And then for benchmark number one, which is the, again, the primary one, here we would recommend, and we talked about it earlier, creating a single BTU specification, but still uh, set the constraints on the spending by the, recognize the constraints on the spending by the based on the SETF fund allocation, uh, 
and then the DCSU's performance would be judged on overall BTUC, not necessarily how many BTUs saved for electricity or for therms or for kilowatts. And then uh, figure out a way to count the benefits of technical assistance activities, which we've been talking about. Uh, but we, we're, we think about placing a cap on how much activities can contribute to the overall target. And we, we talked about that, how much of the budget you pull out. Family Lance has talked about some of the complications in terms of E&D. So it's, it's something where we're thinking about engaging. Yes, uh, Nicole? You saying BTUs was one of the first things that I saw when I came in just recently as, as a major flaw. Is there a huge pushback with that, or why hasn't that been more part of the conversation? It, it has always been part of the conversation, but somehow it didn't happen in the language okay. of the contract. So we're going to hope for okay. the best. Great. I just didn't know if there was significant pushback, because I think that's a fabulous recommendation. Okay. And then uh, set the uh, single target, possibly low 1% of the values, and whether we use 2009 as the base year, 2010, 2011, uh, we would set a lower uh, target in terms of energy consumption. And uh, we believe that if we, if we modify successfully benchmark number one, then many of those things that we talked about as constraints go away. Because we've, we've specified a benchmark that's attainable and achievable, even given the constraints that we've been talking about. But what we do is we recognize the contribution of those constraints, or if we share, uh, allow me the privilege of using the word trade-offs for a moment, those constraints and trade-offs, the question we ask is how do they affect how we set the target for benchmark number one? And if we, if we get the setting of benchmark number one, then we can basically uh, address many of the other issues. And then we, that way we'll make the um, overall package reasonable. But we'll go back and rethink these based on a discussion today as well. Yeah. And again, I, I don't understand changing the target to lower than 1%. Okay. Because I, I believe even if the SEU isn't able to meet it, if the contract is changed, it would be important information for us to understand with that new framework. Okay. By changing the target, I think yeah, this is a performance contract where we want to incent uh, optimum level of work. So unless somebody explains to me, if we change all these other things that we think have been making constraints on them, and then we also lower the target, for the number one thing that they've got to do, then I think that's not sensible. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Duly noted. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, let, so me, Betty Ann, let, me, let me weigh in on that, too, on, on terms of the, even the 1%. I know the 1%. It's the 1% in the statute. We are seeing a 2 to 2.5% two year-to-year -year over the last three years reduction in electricity sales, the actual kilowatt, megawatt hours of sales. Uh, in the District of Columbia, right. two to two and a half percent. 2010, 2011, 2012. These are from figures that are filed, publicly mm -hmm. filed with us in terms of what we monitor. Um, so, I mean, that's happening. Right. right. Yeah, that, that trend data. So, I think one one percent is a result of the work of the SCU. Um, you know, is I think on the cake, I, I certainly would not want to see that reduced. Um, if I could, I think there's two other overall things that need to be considered when we do this uh, benchmarking. Number one, the mayor's sustainability plan, and that had a lot of goals, even in terms of energy use. Um, and then the department, DDOE, um, and maybe Therese, you could tell us, is doing its comprehensive energy plan. I don't know, you know, what's in that in terms of um, reduced energy use in terms of numbers or percentages and over what time period. But I would not like to see the SCU be, be, be given a benchmark that's less than what is in either of those two, those two city uh, policy plans. Okay. Well, those are both good points. Great. We'll, we'll take that into consideration. Yes, Larry, one, last, yeah. one last question. Yeah, I wanted to uh, benchmark the, the BTU saved because while that's a step in the right direction, we're, we're hold up, hold up. We have a side conversation going on here. Putting together electricity and gas yes. overall savings, 
there's more than just BTUs we're talking about here. We're, we're actually also <laughs> talking about energy efficiency. Um, so we could save a certain amount of BTUs in uh, electricity, but we might be talking about an overall efficiency of, say, you know, maybe a 10% improvement. Okay. Um, right. If we replace the BTUs with electricity with gas, okay, mm -hmm. we might be talking about a 30% efficiency improvement. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly the same thing, and we're missing something. We're, we're missing the efficiency discussion, okay. which we couldn't speak of in terms of CO2 gas emissions, if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that we need to we need to somehow factor into this, and BTUs doesn't quite get us there. Right. So there's an the efficiency way. factor, but, but and there are numbers for that that we can we can incorporate. Okay. The efficiency factor, somebody you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. Good points. Okay. Well, that's our that's well. First of all, let me thank you for for that frank and open discussion. It has provided us a lot of information to take back, and again. You know, it's a proverbial thing. Everything we presented, to, nothing we were presented today is written in stone. So you might see a totally new reformulation as in the next iteration uh, because we see this as an iterative process. And again, I indicated we, we haven't had a conversation with Dr. Cooper yet because of some, some constraints in scheduling. So we want to make sure we in, uh, incorporate PEPCO's thinking into this as well. So again, thank you very much. And if you have any other questions, Bill's with Mr. Teresa. And she'll fill them in the lands. And it'll come by to me. Okay, Just to remind me of the schedule for this. I mean, I know we have a meeting of the advisory board early September. And I know that the SEU contract goes into effect October 1? Yes. So uh, when is the final recommendation? How does that fit together in terms of the final recommendation from uh, the consultants and how the board is apprised of where we finally come out with it. Thanks for speaking to that. Once we have the final report from the board, I mean from Jerome Page and Associate, again, we'll share that with the board, and then we'll take in you guys' recommendations on those benchmarks and on the report, and then we'll formulate a final, more or less, response to that, that will engage the DCSCU in the negotiation process as to what the new marks will be. The reason why I say negotiation, because the current contract requires that any changes be mutually agreed to. If we ultimately come up with benchmarks that are not agreed to, then the end result is that we'll be going back out for bid with this process. So once we have the final set of benchmarks, hopefully we can have this process wrapped up by October 1, but even if we spill into October, it would be an immediate amendment to the contract once we are final on the marks for FY14, and then it will be effective for the entire FY14. Well, so what I'm concerned about is that September meeting, so whether it's going to be sufficient time. Will the Page Associates recommendation to you be available so you can share it with us at the September? The September 5th meeting? Yes. yes. So, okay, yes. that's what I wanted. Yes. And just to not, uh, Lance is you know, our, our guide here <laughs> uh, from DDOE. Nobody's recommending changing the benchmarks. It's really changing the targets, and just, what, what targets that the DCSE uses. So nobody's... We won't be recommending eliminating any of the benchmarks. Well, I understand. It gets back to Joe's point. How will we measure that get there? Well, but I want to understand what your, I think the board, not just me, wants to understand what your recommendations are and have an opportunity to meet yes. and discuss them with DDOE. So mm -hmm. that meeting on September 5th will be when that would happen. Yes. Correct. Okay. That's correct. So, well, we'd also like to thank Jerome Page and Associates. Yeah. Thank you. Know, you. The, the Great job. Doing. Uh, you know, I also want to thank DDOE for making sure that this came through on a schedule that allowed the advisory board to weigh in in a constructive way before the report was done. That was also really helpful. A good model for how we can do business together. Absolutely. 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 So, well, we're almost out of time, and I'm not sure if the board would like to stay to I'm sorry? The nomination of the vice chair issue, if we should at least do a nomination and a discussion, or if we should put that on the, on the September 5th agenda. Uh, is there a big debate? If somebody wants it, I'm, I'm willing I'm willing to extend the lead time to cover this issue because we talked about it a lot, but yeah, I'm not. Uh, um, if it should be a sign on the 15 minutes. Well, um, as was suggested, I'm not sure we need to debate it. I just think that we need to have some people, uh, some nominees. And uh, perhaps people should self-nominate. Uh, 
It could be a pretty short process. And, yeah. and right. but, somebody interested in being. But should we vote today or should we vote on the fifth? Okay, before we, um, one point of order is being raised by our general counsel yeah, as it relates to the last. Right, but did you all change the bylaws yet and incorporate a vice chair? Yes. Yeah. And so, and did Nobody you incorporate the duties of the vice chair? We have language in the bylaws, and the duties are, you know, in the June 4th meeting of this meet, uh, this thing, it, it sets forth what that is. Okay. So it's not to um, take over any of the responsibilities that are designated for the chair, but the responsibilities of convening a meeting like today, in which every, for the last three meetings, we have not had a chair or a person to convene. So... I don't, I'm indifferent as to whether we have the discussion today or tomorrow but uh, or the next meeting, but we do need... We need a vice chair. We voted on it. We've changed the bylaws. Okay, sorry. I just did not know... The advisory board the last meeting. would sure. like to have a vice chair. Right. Okay. So are there chair. some other people and interested in serving that? Well, I think that's a good way to put it. I have a nomination, but I don't know if she's interested. <laughs> <laughs> I have one, too. I don't know if they're interested, but I'm going to do it. I'd like to nominate Larry to be the vice chair. He's acting in... Yep. in a leadership role through the Structure and Finance Committee. Um, the group he represents really has, you know, the best interest for the, the global effect of reducing energy and the way that sustainability is measured. Um, he may or may not have worked with, um, with DCSEU, but certainly much less than someone like myself and others might, so conflict of interest in, in some of that. Would be, uh, and he's also very well organized, follows through and pushes it forward. Yes, and so and I have a I have a nomination. I think this will of the the chair of the Public Service Commission as the uh, as the vice chair of this committee. And the reason I would nominate that is because they are a government. That person is representing a governmental entity, and this is a governmental process. And so with that, if we have two, I mean, I have no idea whether the chair would be interested in that. But Bernice, Bernice, let me let me answer that. Um, I I appreciate that, and I've been happy to convene the meeting um, uh, when uh, Keith has not been able to be there. But I don't. Um, I'm going to decline that nomination. Um, a, I've got a tremendous amount of other stuff to do, but also I think that um, I, I, I think that the, um, the the vice chair um, should be a non-governmental person. Okay. Um, I think it will give an added perspective, um, and I think that um, I would not be as free to um, to express views as. A, a, as chairman of the Public Service Commission, I've got that important role to play. Yeah. Um, so I would like to, uh, I, I appreciate it, but I decline the nomination. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any right. other interested? But, I, but I'd accept it. Okay. Okay. Betty Ann, I, I think you make it. And, and, and I'll, I'll, chair, second, uh, I'll second Larry's yeah. nomination. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay. 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 All right. Let's vote. I, Any other I, nominations before we put it to a vote? Go ahead. No. Nope. 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 <laughs> All I'll recuse uh, do we have all? Do we have a, a, a form? form, form. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to recuse yourself. Is Donna still on the phone? Donna, Donna are you still on the phone? Donna? I'm still on the phone. Yes, I am. I'm Thank still you. here. All right. <laughs> so, so we, we do, do have, have a quorum. quorum. Yes, are there any other nominations that anybody wants to make? Yeah. All right. So okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Yeah. We have a vote on Larry Martin being the vice chair of the SEO Advisory Board. Aye. 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 Any gains? Any abstentions? The board, by acclamation. Congratulations, Larry Martin. We got something done. <laughs> <laughs> it took us a while, but we got it. So, uh, well, I just thought, uh, um, if, are there any other issues, any other items to be discussed? If not, well, apologies to the SEU. A group here, are they are you feeling <laughs> neglected or can we just <laughs> no, they're <laughs> they're not their report? No, they're not. They're not on there. Exactly, because they would have sent up the whole test. Right, that's a good point. Okay. 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 I want to leave talk before I have to. Before you leave, Jermaine, the, on the September 5th meet, um, the September 5th agenda, it's Jerome Page. You will be hearing um, the recommendations. And as I said, feel free to forward on any comments you have in the interim. Is there anything else? The board would like to be put placed on the agenda. We'll be discussing the, the general timeline for right. the annual report. The right. annual report. Timeline That's right, there's the annual report. Yeah. 
Do we need uh, two and, and a half hours or two hours? Or how does yes, what time frame time? was the board like? 9 to 12, 9 30 to 12, or 10 to 12? But, I mean, this time frame, adding the extra half hour helped. Right. A lot getting stuff done, so yeah. 9.30. Yeah, 9.30. 930 is because by the time we actually get started, it's a lot of time anyway, so 9.30 is fine. Great. Okay, so with that, it is 10.30. Um, we have three more meetings to go. You can share it very well, Teresa. You're a master. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Congratulations, Oh, did everybody get it? Okay. I don't